I'll just keep talking until I see a cue from you, Sean. But it's a delight to see you, Dr. Kim. We're so glad that you've joined us, that you've joined with us. And let's see. Actually, this will be the second lecture there, if you're controlling that, Tim. Shall I keep talking as a sound test? Okay. Okay. Fine. Yes. Yep. Yep. Sure. Hello. Can sure. you hear me? Okay. Dr. Kim, I can see that you're responding to me. That's a positive sign. I can't hear you yet, but we'll get... Fine audio connection with you earlier in the hour. So I'm very much... And I can see that you're on Dr. Bayes. It's a delight to have you with us, too. Thank you. Can you hear me? Was that you, Dr. That, that was me, Bayes. Can you hear me? Can. Is that you, Dr. Bayes? Yes. I... The audio just went. This reminds me just a little bit of when the orchestra is tuning up. Maybe we should even play that sound for this part of the exercise. Not really. Great. Delighted to see that you're coming back with us, Dr. Kim. One of these black screens, probably Dr. Ray. Dr. Helen Ray, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Aha. I can see that Dr. Ray is also with us. Wonderful. Okay, Dr. Kim, can you hear me all right? All right? Okay. Uh, Okay. <clears throat> okay, Dr. Bay, can you hear me? Just raise your, your uh, hand there if you can hear me. Is my signal coming through? Yes, fine. Okay. Mm hmm. All await instructions. Okay. Is this what you call video feedback when you actually show in the screen the screen that's being shown? So could we zoom into that image forever? That'd be a cool effect for the post-production team to work on. Yeah. <clears throat> Dr.
Dr. Kim, glad to see that you're back with us again. If you can hear me, let me just take the opportunity to see if we can get your image to work right. You've got a window behind you, which will make your image just a little bit uh, um, of a silhouette to us. Is it possible for you to turn your camera maybe to uh, our right so that we get a dark wall behind you so that we can um, fully see your, your, vision, uh, your visual? Is there anything we can do to make an audio connection with Dr. Bayes? I can hear you. OK, that'd be super. Can you actually ask him to move his camera just a little bit there, Sveta, and ask him if he can hear us? I, I'm pretty sure he can't. I can, I can hear you, yes. I can hear you. Yes. I'm, is that you, Dr. Baines? I can hear it all. Fine. Yeah. It doesn't seem like you're hearing me. Oh, dear. I can't move the computer. So all these wires all, all over the place. I can I, 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 I can change the blinds though. Yeah, I, I'll try that. Yeah. Now, but I'm concerned that you can't seem to hear me through the the, the uh, system computer. Yes, Dr. Bayes, we can't hear you coming through. Is his is his, his uh, audio muted? Probably. Uh, no. Okay. Maybe I'm trying to talk to him. Let me go. I'll, I'll go full, full blinds, and, and I know they can't hear me. So you, you can fix that from your end. I'll, I'll go to the blinds now. Hello, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, good. Straight through the internet. Pardon? Great. We can hear you well. Can you hear us? Good. Y yes, fine. No problem. Good. I'm very encouraged to see that. Thank you for your troubles. We're just trying to get Dr. Kim in, but I can see that he is in the broadcast. Doctor, you can hear us. Please just give a signal.
Dr. Bates, it's a delight to have you with us. Can you still hear me all right? Yes, fine. We'd like to use the time that we have with you best we can. Um, our students have looked at a chapter from your text, <clears throat> A New History of Christianity in China. Would you be willing to share with us just a little bit about the journey of how you came to write this book? I know it was a book a long time in coming, and you make some of that clear at the preface, but would you be willing to share the journey of how you came to write this book? Hmm, okay. Uh, are we going to have Dr. Kim speaking? Dr. Kim, he's having internet troubles, and so my thought was simply to use the time that we have with you. Um, again, the students have read part of your work. It's an honor for us to be able to speak with the author, and I'd like to head in that direction as soon as Dr. Kim uh, confirms that he's able to get online and can overcome the internet troubles that he's having, we'll switch to his lecture. Okay, uh, I'll try to give you a few thoughts and, and, uh, and some insight into how, how this all came about. Uh, and I took the title from uh, a book by, by John Fairbank, a great American scholar of Chinese history. Doctor, we can hear you pretty well, but would you be willing to look uh, into the camera so that we can get a full a full image of your face? That's wonderful. Thank you, sir. Great. Um, John Fairbank died in his 90s, and in his early 90s, he finished his last great book, uh, and he called it A New History of China. And so I sort of built on that and decided to write A New History of Christianity in China. Um, the reason there is... I thought there was a need for a new history, and it's a uh, it's a uh, conviction that grew within me over many years, back in the 1970s and, and early 80s, was because it appeared back, let's say, 30 years ago, it appeared that Christianity was a failure in modern Chinese history. It was an example of a place where China was an example of a place on the earth where where Christianity would never take hold. It would always remain a foreign religion. Um, and of course it was originally a foreign, a foreign religion, a non-Chinese religion, but uh, that, that seemed to be historians viewed as a, a fatal liability for Christianity to, to try to get a foothold in China. And gradually I realized that that was not, not, not the case. As time passed, the 1970s into the 1980s, because he worked perfectly fine before. Uh, you can you see me? Ah, can you hear me now? All right. Dr. Kim, we can. I can't hear you. Can you? Can you hear me? Use your can system. You. Uh huh. So if you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. Can okay. you speak through John, the system rather than we'll the phone? We'll hold the introduction. Just let him Somebody go and deliver speak. the lecture as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh huh. Hmm. Uh, I can't hear him. Uh, strange. Hmm. Me? Uh huh. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, yeah. we can hear you, Doctor Bayes. And we finally uh -huh. got Doctor Kim. So pardon the interruption. We'll switch to his right. lectures as quickly as possible. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. And if you can see me and uh, hear me, then I can start. Yeah. That's all right then. Is it all right? Yeah. And if there is a problem, you can just uh, uh, type in the in the message line. Okay. So shall I start then? Uh huh. All right. Okay. I'll stop the phone and then. I'll start then. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. Sure. All right. Let's do that. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'm sorry about the trouble. This is the, um, it's having technology is a blessing, but also it can go wrong quite easily. Um, so I will start the lecture. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, you can see me and also uh, see the slides. Okay. Um, so the uh, um, 
The, my topic is contributions of Asian theologies to world Christianity. Uh, I'm particularly looking at Indian and Korean theologies. Next slide. A Sri Lankan uh, theologian, Aliosius Pieris, mentioned the double baptism in Asian religion and poverty as a key for Asian theology. I would say that poverty is to do with injustice, so the distinctive characteristic of Asian theology is this double, double nature of religions and injustice. So throughout the lecture, I would argue that the issue of inculturation and liberation are the two key points for Asian theology. Due to the lack of time, we can only be selective, and I would like to focus our attention to theologies from India and Korea respectively. So first, next slide, Christianity in India. Christianity in India has developed in the midst of South Asia's rich historical traditions, diversities of cultural expressions, and multi use of languages. has the Asian religious traditions of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Islam, as well as other local religious practices. Three different influxes form the background to Christianity in India. St. Thomas, Roman Catholic and Protestant, and they each form distinctive aspects of Indian Christianity. The arrival of Apostle Thomas in the first century is regarded as the beginning of Christianity in India. Thomas is believed to have arrived on the southwest coast of Malabar and was later martyred on the, east, the southeast coast of Mirapur. Other Christian traders and settlers moved into the west coast of India and later, as a result of persecutions of Christians in the Persian Empire, there were increasing influxes of Christians to India and eventually the Patriarch of Babylon claimed the ecclesiastical authority over these Christians. This Syrian Church of the East suffered its major scheme in the 19th century when the Maratoma Church of Malabar broke away. Furthermore, as a result of intervention of uh, outside ecclesiastical authorities, missionary work by other groups and various internal divisions, there are currently at least six different groups in Kerala who claim their origin in the Maratoma tradition. Catholic Christianity was introduced with the arrival of Portuguese. Ecclesiastical hierarchy was established in Goa. Through the integration of marriage with the local community and the effort of monastic priests and friars, the Christian population of Goa increased. When the propaganda fide encouraged the mission to area beyond political country, Portuguese control, Catholic missionary activities concentrated on the new territories, for example, St. Francis Xavier of the Parabar Coast. Most Catholics are right, but following Vatican II, there have been various changes, including the indigenization of liturgy in the local language and employing Hindu symbols and philosophy. Protestant mission began their work with the arrival in the 1706 uh, of the Lutheran missionaries in Travancore, and which was the Danish trading port. As a result, the Tamil, um, Tamil evangelical Christian community was established. From 1792 onwards, William Carey and other missionaries from England arrived in Sarampore from, which, from where the various modes of Protestant mission steadily developed. And during the late 19th and early 20th century, the conversion of lower and outcasts in various parts of India brought changes in the demography of the Indian religious settings. Toward the independence, there were active discussions of unity among the Protestant denominations in South India and as a result, 
The Church of South India was formed in 1947 as an amalgamation of the South India United Church, Anglican and Methodist Churches. Furthermore, in 1978, a joint council was established by the Church of South India and the Maratoma Church, reflecting a high degree of union. Next slide. So now, theological issues in Christianity in India. Christianity in India, with the exception of the Maratoma tradition, has been introduced in association with the foreign inferior authorities, and this historical attachment has always been a problem for the Christians in this region. I would like to focus on one aspect of Christianity in India uh, in three parts. First is the incarceration of Christianity, that is, making Christianity acceptable and relevant to Indian culture and society. And secondly, theology of dialogue. And thirdly, Indian ways of reading scriptures. So first, incarceration. Due to the vast diversity of religious and cultural communities, one of the most difficult public issues in India has been the problem of communal or sectarian conflicts. Though India has developed a pragmatic concept of living together and a philosophical concept of finding truth and goodness in each other, often communal issues have proved a bone of contention. Indian theological researches are on this issue of living together and appreciating other communities. This incarceration model can be traced back to the work of Robert de Novelli, who in the 17th century tried to relate Christianity to Hindu belief and practices. And in more recent times, Brahmabandha Upadhyayi, who was Catholic convert, who attempted to find a commonality between Hinduism and Christianity. He described he described himself as a Hindu Catholic, saying, we are Hindus as far as our physical and mental constitution is concerned, but in regard to our immortal source, we are Catholic. This idea is further developed in Raymond Panikkar's well-known work, The Unknown Christ of Hinduism. Panikkar was convinced that there must be a meeting place between Christianity and Hinduism in the religious sphere. He believed that Hinduism can be and should be a vehicle for salvation because of the presence of the unknown Christ within it. Panikkar's acceptance of Hinduism as a legitimate way of salvation laid the groundwork for Catholic theologians in India to move from Indian Christianity to Hindu Christianity. The Indian attempt to place Christian theology in Hindu context has been expressed in many ways, especially in arts, due to the Indian tradition of images and seeing as of vital importance to faith. Jodahi, a Christian artist, points out that Indians are interested in images not just for what they are outside, but for the effect they have on the inner disposition of the believers, and the connection between inner and outer is vital for the Indian mode of realizing faith. He further argues, quote, Christianity, therefore, should act like a midwife and constantly bring birth in a society the new from the old in the spirit of love and beauty. Christ himself describes this process using the metaphor of a woman giving birth to a child. In this birth process, there is a struggle and agony, but the climax of this process, Christ is a new spirit of joy and celebration. Next slide. So these are the, some examples of the uh, Jyoti Sai's works. And so the, uh, on the left, the resurrected Christ, and on the right, uh, Dalit Madonna. He is quite a well-known artist and writer. Next slide. 
Next issue is the dialogue. Perhaps the most important contribution of Indian theological thinking to the global Christian community has been the active exploration of the concept of dialogue as a metaphor for theological discourse. A short definition of dialogue can be commitment to one's faith and openness to that of others with genuine respect. Stanley Samatha, Methodist minister and theologian in India, articulated his theology of dialogue as an attempt to understand and express our own particularity, not just in terms of our own heritage, but also in relation to the spiritual heritage of our neighbors of our other faith. His theology is based on his understanding of God's covenant with his people and also Christ's incarnation, both of which demonstrated the dialogical relationship between God and his people. A natural expansion of this understanding is that the relationship between different religious communities should be a form of mutual dialogue and not at all confrontational. Samatha draws his theology from the Indian multi-religious setting, uh, from Indian philosophical approaches of finding truth by consensus, and from an attitude of acknowledging others as partners on the way rather than imposing one's own truth claims onto others. In his approach, mutual respect of one's another's, uh, one another's convictions is of crucial importance in dialogue, and this should take place in community, creating, quote, community of communities, unquote. Indian theology of inculturation and dialogue has been immensely influential in our thinking and Christian approaches to other religious communities. It shows that plurality should be regarded as a blessing rather than an obstacle to harmony, and that active engagement in dialogue with others with respect is part and parcel of, if not essential to any religious life. Next slide. Indian readings of the Christian scriptures. The third aspect of distinctive characteristic of Indian theology is Indian readings of the Christian scripture, which have been creative interpretation of the text and which theological work has been produced from this subcontinent. Community tradition of Sruti and Dvani and therefore it makes sense to the Indian hearers. Robin Boyd asserts that the task of Christian theology in India has been the setting, the sources of authority, and that this source has been always the Christian scripture. However, the scripture for Indians is not necessarily what is written, but rather what is to in tradition, there are various hermeneutical tools in interpreting the texts. According to R.S. Sugitraja, the Hindu approach to Dvani has been used to, to be alternative to Western literary and historical methods in eliminating the biblical text. Dvani is a reflexive and exhaustive method used by Indian grammatians and Sanskrit poetics. And like rhetoric criticism, it emphasizes the beauty and the aesthetic sense of the passage. And this understanding encourages Indian Christians to use the scripture creatively in various art and literature forms. And more significantly, it tends to enhance Indian attempt to interpret the scripture in ways relevant to Indian culture and society, and these approaches have long been accepted and used in the Indian church tradition. Here, I would like to discuss two approaches, further approaches to scripture in Indian Christianity. First, articulating Indian Christology by interpreting the life of Jesus in the Gospels. The concept of God-man is a very familiar one in Indian religious tradition. 
Jesus Christ is widely recognized as in this category, and so the life and words of Jesus are admired by both Christians and Hindus. So for example, Jesus was very early regarded as a guru or avatar, and Indian theologians tend to see the person and teachings of Jesus as authoritative over against the systematization of the text and the Christian doctrines. Indian Christian thinkers and theologians have been constantly struggling to reread the life and teaching of Jesus and trying to revise the doctrine developed by the Western churches in this light. And secondly, Indian Christians have always been engaged in inculturating the text into Indian culture and Hindu philosophies. They have concentrated on the issue of breaching the Christian text with the Indian context and making the text meaningful in such a diverse culture. Developing Indian Christology based on the life story of Jesus is a method that can be found in most of the writings of Indian theologians. And among the sources of stories of Jesus, the Gospel of John is most popular in India because of its myth mystical nature, which appeal to the Indian concept of spirituality. So Abhishek Tananda even described the Gospel as the Johannine Upanishad because of its resemblance of Hindu scriptures. So it is a living manifestation of the scripture in experiencing Jesus Christ by hearing and seeing the gospel in their lives that matters most to Indians. This approach resulted in a very lively and interactive form of Christianity in which this wide possibility of expression naturally leads to a more creative interpretation of the Christian scriptures. So that's the uh, kind of summary of the uh, Indian theologies. Now I would like to move on to the Christianity in Korea, and Korean, uh, Christian uh, theologies in Korea. So next slide. Christianity first arrived in Korea not through the foreign missionaries, but through a Korean scholar. In the 18th century, Lee Seung Hun went to China to study where he met a Jesuit missionary. Lee eventually became a Christian and was baptized in Peking in 1784 and returned to Korea and started to share the, his Christian faith, which led to many conversions. In 1789, when Jesuit missionaries first entered Korea, they discovered that there were already about 4,000 Catholic Christians on the Korean Peninsula. The Catholic Church grew rapidly, but between 1801 and 1867, it faced great persecution because of the refusal of Christians to practice ancestor veneration or worship, and also because of the accusations that the Christians were in contact with the European imperial powers. While the Korean Peninsula was still closed, several Protestant missionaries who were working in China became interested in Korea. And the first official Protestant missionaries came to Korea in 1885 from North America and were soon followed by others. As they started to work in many different parts of Korea, Together with the Korean evangelist, the church began to grow through a series of revivals, the most significant which was the great revival in Pyongyang in 1907. Christians suffered persecutions again during the latter part of the period when the church was under Japanese rule. The Japanese authorities imposed worship at the Shinto shrines and persecuted the Christians who refused and burned down many churches. After independence in 1947-45, the Korean church had to face yet another persecution, this time by the communists. During the Korean War, Christians in communist-led areas were accused of, of being pro-American or capitalist, and many were persecuted by the communist army and local militias. After the war, 
The churches in South Korea, both Catholic and Protestant, grew very rapidly through their engagement in evangelism and church planting. According to the recent consensus, nearly 30% of the population are Christians, Protestant is about 20%, and Catholics about 10%. Christianity has become a major religion, not only in numbers, but also in its influence on society in terms of education, medical work, and social reform. The majority of Protestants are Presbyterians, but there is also a strong presence of Methodist, Baptist, and Holiness churches. Altogether, there are about 230 different denominations and groups. Next slide. So I would like to discuss the Christian theologies in Korea. In my previous publication, I have identified that there are five strands in Korean theology. So Bible Christianity, Revival Christianity, Liberation Christianity, Folk Christianity, and Reconciling Christianity. But here I would like to highlight two aspects, which is quite distinctive drawn from the Korean theologies that is, Revival Christianity and Liberation Christianity. Next slide. Revival Christianity, the Gospel of Holistic Blessing. Revival has been described as a key characteristic of Korean churches, particularly Protestant churches. Anyone wishing to understand the Korean church has to understand its revivals. A series of revivals led by Gil Sun-ju and other evangelists from the early 20th century has resulted in several dynamics in the practice of the Korean church in which Korean Christians experience an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, genuine repentance and forgiveness, and this gives them confidence to preach the gospel and keep the faith in the time of difficulty. The revival meetings were to do with seeking blessings such as forgiveness of sins, personal and national salvation. The peninsula was devastated and the people left in extreme poverty after the Korean War in the 1950s. In this situation, as people were desperately looking for a way to meet their material needs that was both eschatological and experiential, they were seeking the external uh, in, uh, in, internal kingdom, uh, exter uh, sorry, eternal kingdom in the reality of the present situation. There was a rapid increase in revival meetings, and the message preached was to meet people's need of material blessings and healing. The gospel of holistic blessing became dominant in Korean Christianity as these meetings became popular and various religious groups grew up soon after the war. The man who is center of this approach is Paul or David Yonggi Cho of Full Gospel Church in Seoul, as you can see in the slides. The story is one of the remarkable transformation of a church We started meeting in a tent in 1958. Yonggi Cho, in his often quoted book, The Fourth Dimension, described the struggle of hundreds of thousands of Koreans who were living in extreme poverty after the Korean War. It was this harsh reality that brought Cho to seek the meaning of the gospel and adopted the theology of so-called threefold blessing, that is, spiritual well-being, general well-being, and bodily health. The gospel of holistic blessing is not limited to the full gospel church. Indeed, it is found across the whole section of the Korean churches. As revival is a characteristic of Korean church regardless of denominations, so the message of the expected blessings for those who seek is common to most main uh, Korean churches. Good news to the poor in the Korean context in the 1950s and 60s was seen as this gospel of threefold blessing and it seemed the message prevailed. However, there has been considerable opposition to this gospel of holistic blessing, commonly known as Kibok Shinang, from both moderate 
and conservative sections of the Korean church. The critics focused on the negative outcome of excessive seeking of blessings seen in the revival meetings and services. They criticized the revival preachers for their unethical approaches such as offering material blessings and healing. It is not uncommon to see revival meetings dominated by stories and testimonies of those who have received blessing of wealth, healing, and success. There is an excessive drive to increase church membership and construct new church buildings or church prayer halls in the mountains, often by borrowing money from the bank in faith that God will fulfill his promise. The critics are right in that the extravagant demonstration of material blessings in church buildings and membership has become a problem in the Korean church. It encourages a materialistic and mechanical approach to faith. However, these critics have their own biased perspectives. First, the critics focused on the fact that Gibok Shinang is somehow related to the Korean traditional religiosity and they uncritically condemn religious traditions as unethical, selfish, materialistic, and disorderly, temporal, and ahistorical. The fact that Korean Christianity has been influenced by the traditional Korean religiosity is not necessarily a negative point. The religious tradition of Korean people cannot just be dismissed as unworthy. And this interpretation is rather the result of Christian missionary understanding of the religiosity of the people as something inferior, unacceptable, or even evil, and the labeling anything to do with it as a, as a syncretistic. While conservative while conservative theology may meet the need of spiritual fulfillment and eschatological hope, Gibok Shinang has uh, harnessed the people's desire for dream fulfillment in the present context. In Korean religiosity, the desire of something better, both spiritual and material, is expressed as seeking blessings. It is the human, uh, it is a humble desire of those who have not experienced full fullness of life and who are constantly facing despair and poverty. And second, it seems the critics are emphasizing the unworldly aspect of Christian gospel and also stressing the example of suffering of Christ and the cross. It may be appropriate to preach on suffering, the cross, inner spirituality, and future hope to those who are experiencing material blessing, but the poor are suffering and carrying a cross. A message of deliverance and liberation from poverty and the promise of God's blessing is the here and now and is also part of the Christian gospel, often expressed as a shalom, the peace and well-being of God's people. In the context of post-war Korea, many of the Korean church leaders responded to the problem of Paul by tapping into the traditional religiosity and also interpreting gospel as seeking holistic blessing. Though the difficulties remain that the gospel or holistic blessing often threaten the principle of the cross by employing unethical method of the end just by means, Nevertheless, it represents one way the Korean church has responded to the problem of poverty and many testify that it has indeed been good news to the poor. It provided the gospel, the people of Korea with hope here and now through Christian faith and resilience to endure hardship to preserve through the turmoil of the post-war Korea. Next slide. I'm moving into the liberation Christianity. Struggle for justice for poor and oppressed. This is the, another approach to the problem of poverty and injustice. Between 1960s and 70s, South Korea witnessed the rapid rise of the Jebel or family mega companies with the help of government policy 
which started to dominate the Korean economy. And as a consequence, there was a serious exploitation of the factory workers in their working conditions as well as their wages. The majority of pastors saw this problem as a simply matter of progress, of development, and concentrated on their emphasis on church growth. In this period, Jebel and mega churches rose in parallel, and the church leadership believed the growth of the Christian population and the growth of national economy went hand in hand. However, in the context of 1970s Korea, others realized there was a need for a new theological paradigm to meet the need of the urban poor who were victims of highly competitive capitalist market. At this point, some Christian intellectuals realized that the poor are not just poor in the sense of lacking material things, but they are also exploited and unjustly treated and that the gap between the poor and rich and between employee and employers was widening. Son Namdong, among the most well-known Minjung theologians, presented his thesis arguing that Jesus identified with poor, sick, and oppressed, and that the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of salvation and liberation. For him, this is manifested in struggle with those evil powers, and so liberation is not individual or spiritual, but rather communal and political. So systematized his Minjung theology in the following years, seeing the Minjung as a subject of history and introducing Han or anguish and despair as a key theme for theology in Korean context. An Byung Mu, Another well-known Minjung theologian asserted that Jesus identified in such a way that Jesus is Minjung and Minjung is Jesus. Minjung means ordinary people, common people in Korean term. He argues that Christ shared his life with the Minjung to such an extent that the event of cross at the climax of the suffering of the Minjung. Therefore, the presence of Christ is not when the word is preached nor when the sacrament is conducted, but when we participate with or in the suffering of Minjung. Jesus is God becoming flesh and body, which is a matter of material being and reality in everyday life, not of ideology or philosophy, he argues. Therefore, he argued that Minjung is the owner of the Jesus community, and this fundamentally this is fundamentally a food community, a community sharing food. The concept of worshipping community uh, came later. That's his argument. Now, Minjung theologians captured the people's imagination and brought the issue of poverty and exploitation into the church. Here we see Minjung theology as a protest theology on behalf of the Minjung against injustice and exploitation. However, there have been some critique of the Minjung theology in two areas. First, whether Minjung theology is by Minjung or of Minjung, or whether it is a theology by elites for Minjung. And secondly, the question of who are the Minjung in the contemporary Korea and how do they see themselves? Are they only a conceptual group? which is created, created by theologians for the purpose of their argument. So on the question of first question of identity of Minjung theologians, and therefore Minjung theology itself, Minjung theologians did identify themselves with the Minjung by participating in sufferings with them. Many theologians went to prison and went through the hardship during the military-backed government. Because they identified with the Jesus and Minjung in their theology, they suffered with Minjung, and so the Minjung theologians, at least the first generation in the 1970s, became Minjung. But when we uh, come to the second generation in the 1980s, this claim is not firmly founded. The issue for the former was mainly the socio-economic problem of poor workers and farmers, but for the latter, it was political and ideological tensions in relation to democracy. 
The second question of identity of the Minjung is a more difficult one. The term Minjung, which is Chinese word for ordinary people or citizens, was quite a new and unfamiliar one for contemporary South Koreans. In addition, people found it difficult to identify themselves with this heavily loaded term without definite or immediate benefits. In a rapidly changing society like contemporary Korea, people were not prepared to commit themselves to such a stark concept of Minjung and for the cause of Minjung, but in contrast, they rather wished to rise out of Minjung. The fact that many articles were devoted to define the Minjung indicates that uh, unlike black theology, family theology, and Dalit theology, Minjung theologians had difficulties identifying this term with concept and tangible group. Nevertheless, in spite of these problems, Minjung theology has made a vital contribution to the identity of Minjung and encouraged them to stand and speak. So Latin American liberation theology made the point that the poor and oppressed are the ones who need to be liberated, Minjung theology further asserted that Minjung are the subject of this liberation as well as the subjects of history and culture of their particular context. On the whole, Minjung theology has made a, a instrument, has, has been a major instrument of Minjung or civil movement that challenged both the church and society to deal with the problems of socio-economic and political injustice brought to democracy in Korea in the late 1980s and certainly played a prophetic role in Korean history. Next slide. Just give you one example of the Minjung theology and their approaches. This is a poem by Kim Ji Ha, who is a Minjung uh, uh, activist, and then Yi Chol Su uh, artist. Rice is heaven, as you cannot possess heaven by yourself, rice is to be shared. Rice is heaven, as you see the stars in heaven together, rice is to be shared by everybody. When the rice goes, when rice goes into a mouth, heaven is worshipped in the mind. Rice is heaven. Oh, oh, rice is to be shared by everybody. It's quite a striking to present the rice as heaven because often people talk about heaven as a spiritual term only, but uh, this poet, uh, this poem, and the Kim, Kim asserted that uh, rice is heaven. It is a, it is a, it is a, a very material thing. It's, it's, it's quite uh, striking. And the arts uh, present the rice bowl, and then within that is, is heaven. So both revival Christianity, the gospel of holistic blessing, and the liberation Christianity, uh, Minjung theology, can be described as two major contextual theologies intend to address the problem of poverty and injustice in the second half of the 20th century South Korea. The former integrates traditional religiosity and the Christian teaching on the blessings to address the problem of the poverty, and the latter employs socio-political tools developed in the West and articulated in Latin America to meet the question of injustice. Now, I would like to conclude that in conclusion, briefly, I have next slides. I have discussed Indian and Korean theologies in order to demonstrate some distinctive characteristics of Asian theologies and their contributions to theologies in wider context. The two aspects of inculturation and liberation are prominent in both theologies, although I did not discuss the liberation aspect of Dalit theology in the Indian section. Apart from the two strands, theologists from Asia are the result of the struggle of being in a minority, and theologists emerging from this context will be a great contribution to world Christianity, particularly for Western Christianity, which the long been in the position of majority, but now in the rapidly different context of a secular environment. Asian theologists are in the making, and through interaction with the traditional theologists, developed in the West, and also Asian context of rich religions, culture, and society, the findings have been 
and will be a significant contribution to world Christianity. Thank you. Our sincere thanks to Sebastian Kim, professor in theology and public life at the Faculty of Education and Theology at York St. John University in the UK. Thank you so much, Professor Kim. Professor Kim, can you hear us? <clears throat> uh, Dr. Bayes and Dr. Ray, we fear that that uh, Sebastian can still not hear us. So let me confirm with my technical people very quickly, but it may be that we ask you to, if you are willing, Dr. Bayes and Dr. Ray, if you're willing to give a response, that we will call you at a, at a time that is convenient for you and rec have a, a private recording session, and then in a post-production phase, we'll splice in your comments at the end of Dr. Kim's lecture. But can I get confirmation from my technical people? It seems that Dr. Kim cannot hear us. OK. And Dr. Bayes and Dr. Ray, if you can hear me, and if you heard my proposal, can you respond? Yes, I can hear you. This is uh, Helen Ray. Can you hear me? Hear me? Hello? Okay.